Now, I'm sure there are many things about our lives that we would like to change. Uh, it's been seven months now since January, and in January is often the time we make those New Year's resolutions, isn't it? I wonder how they've been going this year. Often by the end of the first week, we kind of go, in, oh, well, there we go again. I've, I've failed. But those, that shows, isn't it, that there are things about our lives that we want to change, things about our attitudes or our habits, uh, things that we know aren't right to us. And if you're a Christian here this morning, you will know that there's things in your life that you know displease God. You know that he isn't happy with. And so you long to change. And maybe over the years you've seen God helping you in those areas. But then you see other things that you think, oh, no, that's not, I need to change there. And, and attitudes and things that we have. And so this morning we want to look at this theme. How can we change as believers? How can our lives be different? Remember what we've been looking at since chapter 4, verse 1. Paul has, has preached and shared with us in chapters 1 to 3 about how great the gospel is and all that we have in Christ, the riches that we have in him. And now he says, chapter 4, verse 1, walk in a man manner worthy, worthy, I'll get my words out now, walk in a manner worthy of the calling that you've had. Think of all that you have in Christ. Think of all that he's done for you now live like it live it out now paul wants to show and, and really flesh that out this morning in this passage that we've got to look at chapter 5 verse 1 to see where he's going therefore be imitators of god as beloved children we are to reflect who god is to those around us he started doesn't he um, in chapter 4 by looking at walking worthy as a church what our life together should look like and now he starts to get really practical in showing uh, how we should be living. And at a first glance, when you look at verse 25 down to 32, it just looks like a long list of rules and commands, doesn't it? You know, uh, put away falsehood. Uh, be angry, but do not sin. Uh, let the thief no longer steal, but let him labor uh, and doing honest work. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. mouth. And it seems as he just a, a long list of commands. And as you read through those commands, what we're going to see is, if we were to live these things out, they make for such a wonderful community. If we are to live these things out, it makes sense in so many ways that we live in this way. And if you look at those commands that we see, you, you might think here, well, they're very common to all the different religions, aren't they? Loads of people would agree with that in the world. You don't even have to be part of a religion to, to see that those are a good idea. But what I want us to do is two things this morning. We're going to see the wisdom of obedience to God's ways here, but then we're going to look at the power of obedience. How can we live this out? Because as I said, the first part we're going to look at, many people would agree with all of those things that we should live in that way. But then we'll look at, well, how do we live that out? How does that work in our daily lives? So let's start then with our first heading, which is this, the wisdom of obedience. As I said, since chapter 4, verse 1, where Paul is calling us to walk worthy of the calling we've had. Look at the truth of the gospel. Look at what Jesus has done for you. Now live it out. He has uh, really been showing us that this is what it means to walk as a Christian. And he's really practical, isn't it? Look at what we look at here in these verses. There's five areas of life he looks at. The first is this. What does a, a life to reflect the gospel look like? One is this. Don't lie, but speak the truth. Look at what we're told in verse 24. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth of his neighbor, for you are members of one another. I told you, look, be honest with one another. Speak the truth. Um, why? Because you're members of one another. You're connected. We've seen that, haven't we? How we're a body. We're one. So we can be honest with one another. Uh, and the problem is, when we're not honest, it pulls us apart. When we're honest, it pulls us together. See, when you lie, when you don't tell the truth, what's happening is you're putting on a mask. You're hiding the real you. And as you do that, you're creating this barrier between other people because they don't get to see the real you. They just get to see this lie, this pretense. And so the more we lie, the more barriers and the more distant we are from each other. But you see what happens when we're honest and when we're open with one another, when we don't pretend well, then the barriers come down. Then we draw closer to one another. So Paul is saying you're members of one another. So be open, be honest. Not just with, with believers, look at saying, but let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. We need to be people who others can trust. 
If we are those who go around lying or exaggerating, when it comes to telling people the truth of the gospel, can people trust their word? Can people say, that's somebody I can trust because I know I can trust their word? Now remember, the message we hold it out is saying, we are telling you the truth about Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. But if the words that come out of our mouth have already been discredited by other things we've said, then suddenly the message we want to share will um, not have uh, the power that we want. It discredits the truth. So the first thing Paul is saying, look, is be honest with one another. Don't lie. Speak the truth. Makes sense, doesn't it? And to have a, a community working together, united together. It's what we need to pray for. See, it makes sense. It's wise. Look at the wisdom here. Secondly, it says, look, be in control of your anger. Verse 26, be angry and do not sin. I wonder if you're surprised to see a command in the Bible that says, be angry. Are you surprised at that? I go, surely anger's a, a bad thing, isn't it? But look at what we told you. Anger in and of itself isn't a bad thing. In fact, sometimes if we're not angry, that is more sinful than um, being angry. Uh, not being angry, sorry. If we're not angry, it's more sinful. So, for example, if we see injustice all around us, somebody being treated unfairly, somebody who is uh, weak and vulnerable being exploited and mistreated, if we are not angered by injustice around us, then there's something wrong. We need to see that there are things around us which should break our heart, just like it breaks God's heart. Think of someone you love and imagine someone else hurting them. How do you feel? Well, you feel angry, don't you? If you don't feel angry, then you probably don't love them. Sometimes anger is the right response. If you love someone deeply and then you see them kind of destroying themselves with, um, with something, with a drug addiction, for example, it is, wrong, it is wrong, isn't it, for us not to feel an anger there. Listen to how Rebecca Manley Pippitt puts it in one of her books. She says, how did I feel when I saw my friend just destroying their life with um, this drug addiction? I was grieved and sickened, but I also felt fury. Everything in me wanted to say to them, can't you see? Don't you know what you're doing yourself, to yourself? I was angry because I cared. Can you see the difference? Here we're commanded, look, there are times in this world which is broken, in this world which is full of injustice, that we need to be angry. Do you need to hear that this morning? Are you too apathetic about injustice? We need to be angry. However, when we're angry and that feeling of anger, when it comes, we need to be aware uh, that we're in a dangerous place because anger can be used in a way that is righteous but also it can become an opportunity for the devil as we see in verse 26 you see um, when we're angry there are times when anger comes out of a sinful heart be angry but do not sin a lot of the times if we're honest when we're angry maybe it comes out of an impatience or a selfishness or a pride we need God's help, don't we, to show us our sinful anger. You will know there's times where you've flown off the handle and it hasn't been a righteous anger. You know times where you were angry because something hasn't gone your way and you've wanted somebody to do something for you in your way, but they haven't. As we thought about earlier this morning, God is slow to anger. There's a patience about God and we need to pray for that. See, when we are angry, uh, there is a, a righteous anger, but also there's a danger there. Look at verse 26. Why um, do not sing, do not the sun, let the sun go down on your anger. Now, it's not literally saying you can keep your anger until the sun sets. Yeah? <laughs> can you imagine that? You know, some, place, some places in the world, the sun never sets at certain times of year. It's just angry all the time. Oh, for the summer months, I'm just angry. Well, no, it's not saying that. Or summer months, I'm more angry than I am in the winter. The idea that the principle behind it is this. We need to not hang on to anger. Don't let it fester. Interestingly, in verse 26, there's two words used for anger there. The word angry and the word anger at the end of the verse are different words. The second word means a resentment. Um, it, it means uh, this bitterness. And if resentment, it can just take over, can't it? If you hold on to anger, if somebody upsets you or has done something to make you angry and you don't deal with it, it just gets worse and worse and worse. And what happens with 27, give no opportunity for the devil. See, the devil can grab hold of our unrighteous anger and can use it to divide us and pull us apart, to make us bitter. 
to make us resentful. Remember what Nelson Mandela said, bitterness is the poison you drink, hoping it'll kill your enemies. Bitterness is the poison you drink, hoping it will kill your enemies. It does no good to you at all. It just it kills you from the inside. So how do we deal with bitterness? How do we deal with anger? How can we get this balance right? Well, when we look at God in, um, in the flesh, when we look at Christ, what do we see there? We see someone who is holy, who is righteous, who is perfectly just. And he sees those things that you should be angry about. So what do we do with that? Well, listen to how Dean Altland puts it in his book, Gentle and Lowly, about Jesus. This sums it up so well. Perhaps you have reason to be angry. Perhaps you've been sinned against, and the only appropriate response is anger. Be comforted by this. Jesus is angry alongside you. He joins you in your anger. Indeed, he's angrier than you could ever be about the wrong done to you. Your just anger is a shadow of his, And his anger, unlike yours, has zero taint of sin in it. As you consider those who've wronged you, let Jesus be angry on your behalf. His anger can be trusted, for it's an anger that springs from his compassion for you. The indignation he felt when he came upon mistreatment of others in the gospel is the same indignation he feels now in heaven upon the mistreatment of you. In that knowledge, release your debtor and breathe again. Jesus is angry on your behalf. Leave it with him. Entrust it to him. If there's something that you might be, somebody might have hurt you or um, done something to you which is so hard to deal with, Jesus knows and he understands. Now, as we look through these things, don't lie, speak the truth. Makes sense, doesn't it? Be in control of your anger. Again, there's wisdom here. It makes sense. Look at the third thing. Work hard uh, and be generous. Verse 28, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Verse 28, don't steal. Quite a simple thing, isn't it? One of the Ten Commandments, don't take things that aren't yours. Now, perhaps you're here and that is something you struggle with. You know, you are tempted to take things that aren't yours because it's easier, it's cheaper, and that is something, and the Bible says it's wrong. We, we, We shouldn't do it. But maybe you're here this morning thinking, well, I've never been tempted to steal something, really. You know, I I don't think that's something I I struggle with. But are there other ways in which we could be stealing? Maybe fudging our tax uh, returns or tax numbers, changing our work hours, cutting corners. Maybe we're stealing in that way. Maybe we're stealing time from other people. Maybe we can steal acclaim or attention when somebody else gets praised. We want to be getting some praise as well. What are we stealing? What are we taking away? We need to be uh, reflecting on it. And, and, and as we see this, what, what is Paul saying? He's like, don't steal, but in fact, work hard. We're going to look at work in the next chapter, uh, but work hard. Serve your God as you work. And then what you have, be generous with it, because God is generous. And he wants us to reflect him to the world. Be generous with what you have. Don't steal and hoard, but give and be kind and generous. So don't lie, uh, but speak the truth. Be in control of your anger. Work hard and be generous. The fourth out of these five is be careful with your words. Look at verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. No corrupting talk is to come out of our mouths. Now, corrupting, that word means rotten. Uh, So you know what it's like. Maybe you've been away on holiday and you forgot to get rid of some food or some fruit from the fruit bowl, and you come back and you realize that one of those fruit or the orange or something was bad, and it's made the whole bowl go horrible and there's flies everywhere. You know, that kind of corrupting has that kind of uh, feel of going through everything. In the same way here, our words can corrupt. We need to be careful with what we say and how we talk. Once a word is out of our mouth, we cannot put it back in. You know, a good thing to do with the children, um, a good kind of illustration of this is to get them out and say, right, got a tube of toothpaste, two children out the front, imagine, tube of toothpaste, say, right, first person to squeeze all the tube, all the toothpaste out of the tube. So you go, squeeze, 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 squeeze. Great, well, you know, we'll see who wins. But then you say, right, first person to put it back in. That's a lot harder, isn't it, to get it back in once it's come out. It's the same with our words. Once you have said something, that is 
is out. We need to be careful what we say. Our words can have a corrupting influence. You've heard the phrase, the phrase and you're the saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me or words will never hurt me. Have you heard that? It's not true, is it? Words can really hurt. In fact, a broken arm can heal quicker than a hurting word. We need to be careful and, and use our words. How are we to use them? Not to crush each other, but to build one another up, to encourage one another. As Proverbs 12 says, there's one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. How are your words? Do they encourage others? Do they build others up? Or do they push others down? Uh, verse 29, look at it again. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only as is good for building up, that it may give grace to those who hear. Do your words give grace to others. You have the potential to give grace to other people, to help others with how you talk and what you talk about. Let's pray that we, have, we are careful with our words. So don't lie, but speak the truth. Be in control of your anger. Work hard and be generous. Be careful with your words. And the last thing here in this section is, don't be unkind, but kind. Verses 31 to 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. So we're not to be bitter, we're not to be angry, we're not to have a settled hostility towards someone. Perhaps that is what you may end up having. You can wish ill on people, that's what the word malice means. Wishing ill, wanting something bad to happen to someone. Now, when you say it like that, I think, oh, I don't feel like that. But are there ways in which that's crept into your life? Wanting somebody not to be successful? Wanting somebody not to do as good as you think? Well, we need to be careful with our thoughts and our words. Clamour, that is rage, shouting, screaming. It just shouldn't be. As Christians, we shouldn't shout at each other. We shouldn't be raising our voices in that way, hold grudges, or wishing ill on others. We have to speak instead kindly. We are to be compassionate forgiving think the best of others not the worst be kind not unkind now as we go through those that list of things five things there isn't there for us to look at and up to this point as you see can you see the wisdom there is in those rules and those commands if we were to obey them church would be a better place the, the community would be, would be a better place and as i said at the beginning most world religions would look at those things and go yep yeah, we agree with that and even if people aren't religious they would look at those lists and say yeah that sounds like a good plan that sounds like a good way for people to live don't lie don't steal you know don't be full of anger don't be bitterness be careful with how you talk to people but here's the problem we know all of those things our society knows those things but we don't live it out do we as we've gone through those things maybe a few of them you've thought oh i'm struggling in that area oh i have failed there and as we hear these commands, as we hear them in isolation, we will feel condemned. We will feel guilt. We will feel shame. So we need more than just the wisdom here, don't we? We need more than just to say, oh yeah, that, that would be a good way to live. That's why I wanted us to see that in this passage isn't just the wisdom, but the power to obey God's word. So if you're looking at your life now and saying, no, I wish I could live like that. Let's pray now as we look at the power of obedience that God would, would show us how we can be changed by him. So let's look secondly then, we've looked at the wisdom of obedience, let's look at um, briefly the power of obedience. So how do we live these changed lives? I want us to see three things very briefly. We need to see that we've got, in, if you're trusting in Jesus, you have a new identity, you have a new heart and a new love. Okay, a new identity, a new heart and a new love. Look at this new identity first of all. Look what Paul says in verse 25 therefore therefore so we've jumped in at verse 25 but there's a lot that comes before it what have we just seen in verse uh, 22 down to 24 put off your old self and remember last time we saw that as a one-off thing you have put off the old self you have put on the new you have got a new identity that is who you are in jesus is now different to, to who you were before this isn't simply saying, no, be a better person, pull your socks up. It is saying that's not who you are anymore. Imagine a caterpillar, and this caterpillar is looking at these birds in the air, and the birds are flying, and it's like, oh, I'd love to fly. 
and um, suddenly this caterpillar goes, however hard he tries, he can't fly, he just can't do it. And then he goes for a very long sleep, and then he wakes up, and somebody tells the caterpillar, come on, caterpillar, it's time for you to fly. And he says, I can't fly, I'm a caterpillar. But we know the story, don't we? <laughs> Actually, this caterpillar is now a butterfly. And so suddenly, this caterpillar has got a different identity. It can fly, because now it has wings, now it has the ability to fly. But he's still thinking he's a caterpillar. He needs to realize my identity has now changed. I've got the wings to fly. And so when he hears the command to fly, he can because his identity has changed. See, sometimes people can think a Christian is somebody who's just called to be nice. Just be a nicer person. That's what a Christian is. Well, no, a Christian isn't called to be nice. A Christian is somebody who is new. We are new, a new creation. And so Paul is saying, therefore, because you are new, because you are somebody different, you are spiritually rich. You are filled with the love of Christ, which we'll get to in a bit. And look what chapter 5, verse 1 says, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. You are children of God. Chapter 5, verse 2, we'll look at these next week really, but look at what it says. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. We are forgiven. We are loved. We are accepted. We are rich in Christ. And when we grasp that, it's going to deeply change us. Let's look again at one example of those commands, at how our new identity can really change us. How do we stop lying? How can we be truthful? Well, one way would be this. Well, don't lie because bad people lie. You don't want to be a liar. You don't want to be seen as a liar. What's motivating that obedience? Well, it's pride, isn't it? you're not really obeying God because you, you're actually creating another sin in one sense because you're looking down on other people. Oh, I'm not, I'm not going to be like that. So you become puffed up. You can be pride. So that's not really obeying that command because you're disobeying another command. Or another way would be, well, don't lie because eventually one day you will be found out. It won't end well. Well, again, who are we looking out for there? We're looking out for ourselves, thinking, well, what is best for me? So how can we not lie? Why do we lie? Well, surely one of the reasons we lie is because we want people to think better of us. We want people to accept us, to love us. We want them to see uh, something that we're not. So we'll exaggerate. We'll bend the truth. We'll make ourselves look better. But when we realize we have a new identity in Christ, it changes everything. I am a child of God. That means God sees who you really are behind the mask. He knows what you, who you are uh, when nobody else is looking. He knows you through and through. He sees all your faults, and he still loves you. He still accepts you. You don't have to pretend with him. So pull the mask off and let him, let him uh, and accept it, um, know his acceptance in Christ, because you're forgiven. You're one with him. And that liberates us then to be truly honest with one another, because God knows me, and he loves me. People know I'm a failure. People know I've done wrong. And so we can do that, uh, be open and honest who we are, because of our new identity in Christ. Do you see? We are um, following him because now that's who we are. You have a new identity in Christ. But also we have a new heart. How do we change? We need to remember we've got a new identity, but also we've got a new heart. Look at verse 30. We didn't look at that verse earlier uh, because I wanted to come back to it now. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed on the day of redemption. We are told that when you trust in Jesus, you are given the Spirit of God. He dwells within us, and he gives us a new heart. A heart that was stone is now a heart of flesh. And that, begin, that means we start to love what God loves. We start to want what God wants. And our heart is changed. We're changed from the inside out. Now, in our garden, we have an apple tree, which was given to us on one of our anniversaries, which was fruit. I can't remember which one. I think it was the third anniversary. We had a tree just turn up on our doorstep in a box. It was from my mother. Uh, but we've, we've somehow kept it alive and is in the corner of our garden, and it is producing apple trees. Apple trees? Apples. Now, imagine if I said, actually, I want a lemon tree. So this year, what I'm going to do is grow lemons. So I buy some lemons in Tesco, and I get my stapler, and I staple some lemons to the lemon tree. Now, will I grow lemons from that tree? If you're not into gardening, I, I don't know anything about gardening, but even I know, no, that's not going to work. Why? Well, the problem is it's an apple tree. And so what is the fruit that's going to come from that? Apples. However much you try and staple something else on, it's not going to change the tree. 
Now, look at verses 31 to 32. How are we to live out that, to not be unkind, but be kind? All of these things, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, they all come from our hearts. So we can't just pretend. It's going to come out who we really are. Out of, out of the, uh, the, the, uh, the, our heart, the mouth speaks. Um, the good person out of good treasure of his heart produces good, Jesus says. The evil person out of evil treasure produces evil. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So we need a new heart. We need to be changed from the inside out. We need to desire what God wants us to desire, and that's what his spirit does. We, as we let him and accept him to dwell in our hearts, to change us, and want to do what he wants. So we need to ask, Lord, what would you want me to do today? As we come to his word, we say, Lord, show me and speak to me about how you want me to walk. So we don't walk as we want, but we walk as he wants. We don't walk as the flesh wants, but we walk by how the spirit wants us to walk. Now, it's interesting what happens here, because when we do fail, look what happens. What does he tell us about, verse, about the Spirit? Verse 30. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Our behavior can hurt God. God dwells within us, and we can hurt him. We can grieve him when we fail. Now, God loves us so much that he doesn't want us to destroy our lives. You can only grieve for somebody if you care and if you love, and that's what we're told. God loves you so much. He is grieved when you go against him because his ways are best. His ways are the way which, ways which keep us safe. He doesn't want us to destroy us. So when we fail, we're not just breaking rules or commands, we're breaking God's heart. We grieve the Spirit. Notice what's encouraging here, though, in verse 20, uh, in verse 20, uh, verse 30, sorry. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. God's Spirit isn't going anywhere. If we failed him, we might have grieved him, but he's sticking with us. Isn't that encouraging? He's not going to give up on you. So this morning, if we realize I've been grieving the Spirit, and God just feels distant. It's not a surprise that God feels distant if we walk in disobedience. In the same way that in a friendship or a marriage, you can be physically close, but you can be strangers because you're far away uh, emotionally. Maybe that's you and God this morning. You've been walking away from him going against his ways, and you've grieved the Spirit. He's hurting. He's not going anywhere. You are sealed with him for the day, day of redemption. He's sticking with you. So this morning, turn to him. If you feel distance from him because you know you've been grieving him, turn to him and say, Lord, please help me. Please forgive me. And he won't leave us. He's with you. He'll help you. Repent this morning. Turn to him. The Spirit is at work within us and won't let go he has begun a good work, and he win, will bring it through to completion. See, our new identity, who we are in Jesus, helps us see, I, I'm accepted in Christ. I can live out of that. Our new heart means that God is changing me from the inside out. As one person wrote, and people disagree who it was, it might have been John Bunyan, it might have been another John, but listen to what um, this poem says. Run, John, run, the law commands, but gives neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly, and gives us wings. So we're not being told, you need to do this. They're saying, no, God gives you the power to do it by his spirit. A new identity, a new heart, and the last thing is a new love, very briefly. Uh, chapter 5, verse 2 says, walk in love. That kind of sums it all up. You want to sum all these things up? Walk in love, as Christ loved us. As you look at those commands, as we look at those, that way of living, it's costly, isn't it? How can I keep on doing that? How can I keep caring for others? thinking of my words to build others up? How can I be careful with my anger to not let it take over? How can I not harbor bitterness? How can I be kind? All these things just seem so, well, they're all giving, aren't they? How can we give like that? Because as chapter 5 verse 2 tells us, that Christ has loved you with an everlasting love, a love that will never let you go. You are filled with the love of Christ. The Holy Spirit, we're told, pours the love of Christ into our hearts. He fills you up so instead of using other people to make us feel better about ourselves, we are ready to serve one another and help them because we are loved with an everlasting love. I remember my brother's advice to me before university. Uh, he gave me one bit of advice, and it was this. Don't shop when you're hungry. Don't shop when you're hungry. It's a good bit of advice. If you go shopping when you're hungry, what do you end up buying? Stuff that you don't need. 
You get your motives for choosing things are hunger rather than your budget. <laughs> and so you end up overspending because, oh, but if you're full and you go then, then you can choose wisely. Then you can trust your motives. As a community of people, we are filled with the love of Christ. So our motives then can be, what can I do to serve you? Not what can I do to serve you to actually benefit me, but what can I do for you? We give and we're able to give and we're able to serve because we have this new love, this love of Christ that has filled us up. So how can we be resentful and bitter when God has forgiven us for all the wrong we've done? How can we not be generous and um, be ready to give sacrificially when God has given his best for us? So can you see what this passage is showing us? How can we be transformed? How can we be changed? Can we see we need to keep our eyes on Jesus? He is the one who shows us, look, you've been made new. You are loved. You are accepted. You are in Christ. Now live that out. Maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian. And you realize there's stuff in your life you would love to sort out and you just can't. And you just seem in a mess. Today, Jesus says, come to me. Turn to me. It doesn't mean that all your problems will go away. But he offers us a glorious fresh start every day. He is one who says to us, look, I will forgive you for all the wrong you've done. Don't delay. Turn to me now. You can always run and turn to Jesus. The God who made you loves you. He doesn't want you to destroy yourself with um, living against his ways. Jesus has died to set you free. Turn to him today. And if you are a believer, let's rejoice in that truth. And let's pray that we live lives uh, aware of our new identity in Christ. Aware of our newness of life our new heart, and this new love that we've been given. I'm going to uh, stop for a few moments just for us to uh, reflect on these things and then uh, give us a chance to think that through for a few moments before we sing our last song together. So let's just be silent for a few moments as we uh, reflect on what we've heard. Father in heaven, we ask that you would help us to live lives worthy of the calling that we've been called to, to live lives of obedience to you, knowing that we are loved and forgiven by our wonderful Saviour. We pray, Lord God, that you help us in our need to live faithful lives, to bring glory to you, and that show everybody around us who you are and what you are like. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.